FX medicine is evolving. The same evidence-based research, ideas and thought-provoking conversations that you love in refreshed new formats. To help co-create it with us and for member rewards, sign up at fxmedicine.com.au. For now, enjoy this podcast previously recorded with Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only and is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us today is Cherry Wills. With a first career and PhD in colour chemistry, Cherry saw the light, forgive the pun, and decided to study nutrition. Her passion is a food focused approach concentrating on metabolic balance. Welcome to FX Medicine, Cherry. How are you going? Thank you, Andrew. It's, yeah, I'm good, thank you. Now, I have to say, what a fortuitous name to have, Cherry. <laughs> I know, I know. I kind of almost wonder if my mum destined me this way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, it's often what I say, yeah, I am, I am a nutritionist called Cherry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so let's start right at the beginning. We're talking about this whole group of metabolically inclusive diseases called non-communicable diseases or NCD. Yeah. What exactly yeah. is involved or included in the NCDs? It's really, it is all of those um, conditions like hypertension. It's the um, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, cancer. It, it is those conditions that are sort of so widespread within our community and our society, but they are not. Um, catching they're not contagious but they are very much a part of our lives and create such ill health in society so and and that is really where you know we know that diet and lifestyle plays an enormous role in um, these non these NCDs um, you know the World Health Organization estimates about a third of deaths worldwide can be attributed to um, NCDs, you know, that may even be a very much an understate underestimation. And it's all the standard risk factors, you know, hypertension, tobacco use, um, hyperglycemia, uh, physical inactivity, um, and being overweight, um, you know, yeah. obesity. Yeah. Those are the key risk factors that are all associated with NCDs. Yeah. But so it, it, I'm I'm going to assume that it excludes those uh, f- factors like genetic factors and includes only those diseases that have significant diet and lifestyle modifiable factors. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's. Um, but then you know, I w- I would even question whether you know we know how the environment and we know how lifestyle can even impact on the genotype. So, are we even in today's society leading to more potential future NCDs because oh. of the way? <laughs> it's a whole minefield that I think that we are opening up for our future because we are not addressing the NCDs now. Don't, don't um, ask a government to think ahead. Yes. So, yes. Oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about the prevalence of these NCDs, particularly things like, you know, obesity. I mean, um, I think, I don't know about now, but I think at one stage Australia was the fifth obese company in the world. Is that right? Um, I am pretty sure that this, the stats are now that at least 70% of um, Australian adults are either overweight or obese. Right. Um, and just that you know statistic in itself is um incredible i mean other statistics i find quite incredible like less than five percent apparently eat five fruit and veg servings a day (laughs) you know it's like the you know and 
um, even just drinking the water and, you know, getting out in sunlight and getting enough sleep and um, having good stress management um, techniques, all of that plays a big role in why we have such um, a high prevalence of, um, you know, of NCDs. Yeah. Um, diabetes itself has been very much shown to be highly influenced with, by physical activity um if you take if you take away the genotype influence or even the dietary influence if somebody isn't active enough that massively ramps up their risk of diabetes so um it's you know it's it's almost like we've created this perfect storm yeah. of um of all of the factors that come together in our society mm -hmm. to bring on this incredible health burden um which you know, it's just mis misery for so many people is the is the most dangerous word that we've ever made for ourselves the word convenience convenience, <laughs> convenience well, travel yeah it is it is i mean i would say we have never had so much um so so much excess on on our doorsteps in many ways we we don't have to one of my little theories is actually as a society we've become quite intolerant to the feeling of hunger Nobody has to be hungry in our society for more than a couple of minutes. You know, you can feel, oh, feel a bit peckish. Oh, I'll just get rid of that. And so we have this grazing attitude. You know, we can have breakfast 24 hours a day. <laughs> we, could, we can have any meal at any point and we can get Uber to deliver us, you know, to deliver it to us. So we don't have to get off our bums and get yeah. out, you know, walk to the shop even. So, um, and I think that's part of the, you know, the, this, this loss of even the structure in our day. Um, it used to be only, say, 30 years ago, you had to have lunch between 12 and 2, otherwise the cafe was closed. You know, now, well, you can have it at any time. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, food and meals have almost become the lowest priority of somebody's day. They will fit every other meeting in place. They will do all the other things that they have to do. Oh, and they'll just, oh, oh yeah, I'm hungry now. I'll just grab that and I'll just go. Um, and yet, you know, what we are eating every single day is what actually has the biggest impact on our health. So it's almost this complete topsy-turvy world. Um, and then, you know, it's like, well, why am I ill? Why am I overweight? Why do I feel tired and lethargic? Um, give me a magic pill, do some tests to me that will just say it's not my fault and, you know, it'll fix me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible world that we're kind of living in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I have to cover a question early off, and that is, we are, it, it's almost like politically incorrect to say somebody's overweight now. I mean, I know I'm, I'm overweight. I'm, I'm fat. I used to be very, very slim and, and fit and things like that. I'm fat because I sit down most of the day. I don't get off my bum and I rely on convenience. I own that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's almost like you can't say the word fat to a patient because then you're body shaming. So, so where do you, where do you like yeah. cover or jump over this line? How do you cover this with patients? I actually find, yeah, that's a great, you know, it's a fascinating question. And actually, because I am, I am very much about creating the, you know, the ideal health for a person. So I, I don't even really talk about doing diets. I actually talk about, we want to create a healthful environment for your body. Right. so that you your all of your body processes actually start to work um yeah i i actually do think like you many people own the fact that they're fat <laughs> i mean i do think it's a it's a it's a it's a very much a, a fact of life that yeah. this is the case yeah um and i am in what i find incredibly i get so angry about and very frustrated as that is when it is seen as some kind of shaming situation you know, people are shamed into it. And often, you know, even those awful programs like The Biggest Loser, where they literally are, you know, putting a, a person who is so, you know, in such an unhappy place and they are shining this massive light on them and telling them, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. And yeah. It's absolutely terrible. Um, what it is, is, is helping people really just take control of their, their health 
and actually we get you into a healthful place and then we see what your body does and it's kind of you know i like to also have a the health goal, not a weight goal. You know, we are talking about where we can get you healthy. Mm. And that is very empowering as well for some people, because the other thing, if you talk about weight and you talk about losing weight, that's kind of a, a, a short term goal that, so, okay, somebody crosses that line and then, okay, with, I'm there now, I'm end of the race, so to speak, or end of that. I'll just, I'm there and I'll just, abandon everything I've just done because I'm now here I've arrived (laughs) and actually I am I talk also so much about um well where you know your health journey is until you die so it's till you literally take that last breath and you're always going to have different moments where you are leaning in and um and you know allowing your body to be you know you're focusing on your health whereas other times you might be a bit more relaxed about that focus so um it's it's just it's so important to talk about health and where you ultimately want to be in two weeks six months five years 25 years time and i feel if if we keep that eye on the goal because so many people they find themselves in a situation of dis and um, you know um and dis, uh, unbalanced they're unbalanced they're um their whole met- metabolism is out of sync um they can't do anything about it and all they're seeing is potentially you know um waiting rooms for doctor doctors waiting rooms and diabetes around the corner yeah i want to get into exactly what metabolic balancing or metabolic balance is in a tick yeah um forgive me no i want to do that now <laughs> Because I want to get into these, these like aiming for health bit, uh, a little bit yeah. later. So metabolic balance, what exactly is it? Metabolic, metabolic balance is um, a program that was developed by a German doctor and nutritionist team um, back in 2002. And it, uh, it was Dr. Fun Fact, Sylvia Berkel and uh, Brigitte um, Fun Fact. And they, Dr. Funfax, you know, he had uh, his whole PhD, his whole research was all on metabolic disorders and helping his patients in clinic. And he was very frustrated by the, the lack of progress that they were getting um, with the standard approaches. And they really set about trying to find a way of personalizing the food intake for their patients. So they've created this system where we take um, 35 blood parameters and we take um, a client's um, body measurements and their current medications and their health conditions that they have. We put it all into this into this database and then it generates their personal food list and menu plan. So it's a purely food approach and that is what somebody then follows. Um, and it's was, it's almost like this kitchen table kind of approach that has now through word of mouth spread around the globe into 35 different countries and it's practitioner only. So it's, um, it is about a real, it's a great integrity and um, real results for clients because practitioners, I certainly would not be using it eight years later. I've been using it for eight years now mm. and I certainly wouldn't be talking about it if it didn't, if it didn't give real key changes to, um, to clients. Yeah. So we, on the, anybody with half a brain knows that the standard Australian American diet, sad, whichever one you choose. Yeah. Um, I don't, what do you say in England? Sid? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, we know that it, it, for most people it's unachievable. Um, yeah. It, it certainly isn't adhered to. One of the biggest issues is portion sizes. But, but one of the sort of questions I have is where does, did Dr. Funfact get the data, if you like, to, to spring from, to, to start looking at this sort of, these parameters um, and yeah. be able to say, well, that's what the goal should be. 
And the, I mean, everything is based on nutrition science. Um, it is also based on his observations in his clinic with his patients. And it was a trial and error thing, I would imagine. I mean, I have to say, um, unfortunately, Dr. Funfact did pass away in uh, 2013. So I've not unfortunately had a conversation with him exactly how this came about, which I would adore to, you know, I wish I could have done. Um, but he very much took a, a a completely different view to metabolic syndrome and the, the diabetes approach um, to, you know, to go down the role of, you know, balancing insulin and carbohydrate intake is, is always going to be a completely crazy balancing act. Whereas if you actually properly control the glycemic response, um, actually put in the order, the correct you know, order of foods into the, in, in meals, do that time restricted feeding. I mean, this is why I really do talk about um, uh, Dr. Funtact as being very visionary with his approach, because now the research is catching up with what he presented 20 years ago. We wow. have so much research that talks about time restricted feeding and interval control of, of foods, um, portion sizes, the, the influence of the gut microbiome, the um, you know, digestive function, liver function, um, hormone balance. So all of this is coming into fruition and it's, it's, it's even giving more validity to the original ideas of, of Dr. Funfact. Does it, does it have anything to do, not all to do, but does it have anything to do with that old adage about breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper? Is that... Well, actually, metabolic balance is the opposite way around. We actually do suggest having a smaller breakfast, yeah. a medium lunch and a bigger dinner. So what? that's actually almost, it is a different, it is, a, it is different to that. But we definitely recommend the three meals a day. You have to fuel yourself and you also have to give your body time to properly process all of those foods. We do, we, we are, there's no snacking, you know, snacking and a little bit like where I, at the beginning, when I mentioned, you know, we don't have to be hungry for more than three minutes. You know, we can just reach for something. And that is a very dangerous place to be because you never, you, you know, you don't know how much you're eating often. And the glycemic control is, is very much dysregulated because the body's never really able to get everything back into play and back into balance again and level things out. Um, we, you know, the, I fully believe that the human body is the most amazingly engineered uh, system yeah. that has when it's given the opportunity it will all synchronize in a very very balanced way and you can go through the day very very easily and naturally without having those dips in blood sugar level um, and I'm a classic example you know when I was um, in you know in my early 20s well throughout my 20s I had terrible glycemic control I was known as the snack queen <laughs> oh, wow. I had the snack drawer in, in the office that everyone knew was where the chocolates and the crisps were kept um, and I couldn't go through the day without snacking I was terrible and that was you know I knew things weren't right and that was when I saw a nutritionist but it it wasn't until uh, 2012 when I introduced MB and I did it for myself that I actually got my glycemic control and under control right and now no issue whatsoever okay so, so talking about hunger um, what is it hunger tiredness and lack of time they're the three biggest hurdles for yeah weight loss now I, I get that mm -hmm. we're not talking about weight yeah. loss here. I get we're talking about health but yeah. if somebody is going to enter into a program where they have to become comfortable with hunger. How do you get them comfortable with hunger? I d definitely do not say that with MB you are hungry. That is one of the key things. When you actually do the process correctly, yeah. there is no hunger. And I, not, and, not even I like say, five, you know, three to five days of going AWOL, doesn't happen? No, I, no I, there, it, it, if they are hungry, then we need to tweak it we need and I know all sorts of ways to tweak it so I want some you know if a client of mine is hungry between meals I want to know almost immediately and I want to then work on that to make it 
tweak it and different and that might be changing the the, the breakfast um, it also depends on which interval of the day people are feeling peckish it's not necessarily the meal just before that it's actually the meal before yes. the yes. meal before that yeah. because it's the yeah. it's the ripple effect yeah. that then becomes more manifest so yeah. we you know if somebody's hungry mid-afternoon i might i'll be wanting to look at their breakfast how do we make breakfast a better foundation for their day that ensures their whole glycemic control through the day is properly balanced? And that's where we, we, we tweak it. But it's also the, the um, food order that plays a massive role. Uh, we like to have that first mouth of protein because that equally gets all that uh, glycogen and insulin into the right balance. That plays a massive role now, this is so again, this is where MB, you know, Dr. Funfact was, a, you know, he was ahead of his time. We yeah. now have even more research demonstrating what he brought in 20 years ago. Okay, so this is really interesting because I thought it was debunked where, about this sort of, um, uh, you know, don't have this food with that type of food. Um, it's not food combining, it's the food order. That's right, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. what you're talking about though is not what was originally thought about about the digestive juices but what you're talking about is the responses the body responses yeah and that is it really what um you know like going into what personalized nutrition really is and where do we what do we use as the medium to find that out right. because um you know the there was a study last year in 20 you know 2019 there was a study that looked at um uh, 11,000 people. It was um, King's College London and Mass uh, Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and 60% of those respondents were twins. And they basically gave them the same meals and then measured their glycemic responses, what actually happened as a result of eating that exact same meal. And they showed that even between twins, they had very distinct differences with what happened. So giving the same food to somebody with the same gene, two people with the same genotype, mm -hmm. you get two different responses. So this is again, where you have to, you know, to me, this is saying, can we really go down the route of saying a genotype personalized approach? Because if that's even the case, that's totally not gonna give us what we need. And this is where I fully believe that we have to look at all of the aspects that come into play for a person's health and where they are to find the right foods for them. What about uh, people who choose different diets like vegetarians, pescatarians, vegans? Oh. Well, that really comes where I, I talk about a lot of that with as sort of an aspirational idea of what you would like to be eating so aspirational nutrition as opposed to as opposed to personal nutrition mm -hmm. and we it's kind of like it's trying to say well from my own desire i'm going to make my body work on that fuel mm -hmm. it's a little bit like saying a cat should be a vegetarian you know <laughs> um they're not gonna that's not gonna work for a cat to be optimally healthy you know yes you can argue it will kind of survive but it will it you know will it and it's the same way with a person and we have to we have to take it all into account as to what really is right for that person so for, for somebody who has a genetic background and um, an environment and that needs more of an animal meat approach to say, look, I want to be vegetarian and I want to be healthy. I will be healthy and yet ignore all of the symptoms that might be arising from that. Um, I find, I just find it really bizarre. You know, I had one client who I very much remember she had, um, she came to me because she had was was feeling terrible tired all the time horrific hormonal menopausal symptoms um put on about 10 kilos of weight in about you know 10 months um and just felt terrible but yeah. i when questioning it was like well she went vegetarian about a year ago <laughs> so it was like well i just do not think that the diet you are you know you're choosing right now is actually sustaining you and we need to relook at that and her response to that was, I'm not sure I can sacrifice my principles for the sake of my health. 
And I just remember being, those words have stuck with me for ever since because I was so taken aback that you, that you decide that, that somebody can decide so strongly that they have to eat a certain way and ignore all of the aspects. Now, what I would definitely say is some people suit of a definitely suit a vegetarian diet, you know, or are more leaning towards a vegetarian diet, whereas other people most definitely do not. Um, and it's about actually finding what that is for you and kind of accepting it as that is your reality, as opposed to being, you know, it, it's like an inconvenient truth <laughs> in many yeah. ways. This is the truth of the situation and we can't change. It's like deciding I want curly hair, but I've got straight hair. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, what about though long-term health or, or disease um, issues when you, you've got like, for instance, if you say somebody is more suited to a meat diet, but we know, well, do we know um, overall population on a population level, we know that a plant-based diet, a plant-based diet, not a plant total diet, but a plant-based diet, certainly more plant, plant protein than what we're currently yeah. receiving, is healthy for long-term cardiovascular stroke and cancer effects, particularly bowel but cancer. But you see, that again is good. Sorry, to, to, to interrupt you yeah, there, yeah, Andrew, no. but I would say that's really playing into a um, sort of the um, epidemiological studies that yeah. are not really looking at a personalised level. We are, and it's it very much is, you know, in my opinion, you can. It it is the individual inflammation in a person that leads to all of those conditions, you know, cancers, cardiovascular disease, yeah. um, diabetes, and to simply say that it's exactly the same foods that are leading to that inflammation in that person, that is where we we you're coming back to the one size fits all approach. Gotcha. And um, kind of when you genuinely go down that personalized route um, and really find which are the right proteins for that individual. And it's even down to, you know, we can find out down to which cuts of meat, whether somebody should be having a pork chop or a pork fillet, because that is a different protein structure yeah, right. and give the different nutrient and that is the that is the depth of the um, the analysis that we can do. It's finding the different, um, you know, parts of the of, of a meat, or even the whether you should have the whole cauliflower or the cauliflower leaves. That's because we're talking about different nutrients. Please there. make mine the eye fillet. Please make mine the eye. <laughs> well, you know, I remember there was a, you know, I've I remember so many clients who they pop into my mind, but there was a, you know, like a tradie, big big guy. He was like six foot four. Mm. He was um, one hundred and sixty kilos definitely needed to lose weight though right. um and he um when his plan came back there was no meat on it and he looked at it he goes well where's my meat and he's like a barbie you know a barbie is you don't put salad you don't do salad with the yeah, barbecue yeah. you know you, 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 it's just yeah, your meat. Can. and i'm like <laughs> that is what your body needs and and that's the thing when you have an analysis that does that for you it's kind of like, well, there's no arguing. There's no negotiation. Look, you're doing this. This is okay. what you're doing. This is All right. what your body so, needs. So what was his, his adherence like, seeing as, seeing as it was so um, dystonic to his previous life? It was great. It, honestly, that's one of the key things because you have an analysis that is done on a person's blood. They are also, you know, they are fully committed because they've gone down the route of going and having their blood done. They are there in your, they want change. That is actually the key thing. It's so rewarding to be able to help people get the change they want because so often people are helpless. They've tried all sorts of diets, all sorts of approaches and nothing. They're killing themselves in the gym and nothing is really shifting. Yeah. And yeah when you give somebody just a key plan, this is what you are doing. And also the key point as well is that they are actually getting results quickly because it's kind of, you know, when we talk about um, personalized nutrition and bringing everything together all at the same time, I like to really see it as like that perfect synchronicity, which is 
the opposite of the perfect storm. We know about the perfect storm for ill health, you know, stress and accidents and, you know, pharmaceuticals and antibiotics and all that kind of stuff comes in and creates this environment that leads somebody on a cascade of ill health and getting one thing after another and just going down that pitfall. Well, flipping that on its head, how do we bring that perfect environment of all of the aspects together that actually is that perfect synergy that just when you have that person in the center and all these aspects genuinely match that person suddenly it it does not take long it takes you know a matter of days and you have got change right and and i'm not talking about rapid weight weight loss i'm talking about change i'm talking about just that brain fog lifting, the yeah. headaches going, the body aches, the joint pain disappearing. Those kind of things are all signs of imbalance and inflammation. Okay. So, so when somebody has those differences, they're like, I'm, I'm not changing this. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about <laughs> their, their compliance is, is Yeah. What, what Sorry, about- what was that? What about um, measurement, though? So you're saying that you're looking at these markers, at, at numerous markers. Yeah. Um, you can see change subjectively. I feel better, the brain fog's lifted, that sort of thing. Mm. What about objective markers, though? Hypertension. Yeah, definitely. Um, re, you know, reduction of, say, coronary artery calcium score, um, CRP, all of that sort yeah. of um, tumor necrosing factor. Can you see yeah. these objective changes and how often do you test? So we all, because we, we have the, the initial pathology, that is what we use to create. So we have the starting point. So that is our baseline. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, yes, you can test as often as you want. I mean, I would say the, I like to test the retest around the three to six month mark again. Yeah. Um, I always want to have a retest and then we can analyze it and see the differences. Um, we, also you are monitoring waist hip thigh measurements on a daily basis and also the other thing that i do with every client is i'm looking at their body composition analysis right so there'd be you know the um using um you know a a quad scan that really changes things and you can see on the screen the changes in the fat um you know the hydration the um the inflammation markers those are all shifting from day what you know from that almost because i'd like to see somebody on day five actually so i then doing i'm doing my second scan on day five Mm -hmm. and you are seeing a change and it's and that's what i talk about when you do bring that perfect synergy into play do do you everything comes together and you wake up the body You're, you're waking up all the body processes um do you do you find or is there that risk i guess that um, you know, on most diets, you'll get an initial fluid loss and people going, oh, I've lost weight, but then it plateaus. Yeah. So when you hit that barrier, do you hit that barrier with this sort of metabolic balancing? I would say um, there's always a weight, um, a fluid loss, pretty much. That's the yeah. inflammatory oh. loss. But we very much kick in very quickly into that fat burning. And that's one of the key things that metabolic balance does. It actually does change the, you know, the basal metabolic rate because that is actually the key thing that we have to shift in order to get real weight loss happening with that. And while we're protecting the muscle, protecting the muscle has to be your key priority mm-hmm. as well because if you're that's one of my biggest uh, you know know, dislikes often about the ketogenic approach you lose so much muscle you know i've seen i've had clients you know women um postmenopausal women who have actually created uh, pretty much uh, you know a a state of ill health of of low muscle mass sarcopenia going on so you've got to protect the muscle and you want to lose the 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 fat mass i would say the key thing about mb is when somebody really does focus on their foods when you keep that perfect synergy it's like you're walking down a set of stairs it is it's a gradual nice release but the more you bring in other aspects that aren't that are going to you know break that synergy then you get a slowing down which isn't always a bad thing in many ways because 
what we really want to try and do is bring somebody into a great place that this becomes their lifestyle. They do not see that they have to always be, um, you know, being strict. Um, but as long as they're going in the right direction, um, that is really the, the, the full, you know, the real aim of changing that lifestyle for the long term. And then everybody, the people know when they really want to have significant change again, they just come back to those key foods. They really focus in, they lean in and they really stick to their metabolic balance food list. Um, and that can just be, it's like that intermittent dieting. There's great research that talks about the benefits of intermittent dieting. Mm. Because especially when you've got somebody that wants to lose 40, 50, 60, you know, more kilos, you have to have that real nice balance of a good quality of life without them, you know, for, for it to be long term. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, yeah, well, sorry. We, we mentioned, you just mentioned lifestyle, and of course, lifestyle isn't just food. It, it's, you know, the stress and the sleep and exercise, mm -hmm. which we always forget to do. Um, so how do you incorporate these aspects into uh, metabolic balance? Uh, that is very much naturally done over the coaching period because that's one of the key visions as well of Dr. Fun Fact um, and, the, you know, when, they, when MB was founded is that people need support. They need to have that, um, that coach, that um, professional who is um, really there for them and supporting them while they're doing the lifestyle change. And that, again, is being very much borne out in the research for long term sustainable success. It works so much better when people are supported. Or, so we know this. Yeah, the only two ones that have gained long term uh, benefits, um, it, what is it, longer than two years, was yeah. those which had support. And there were two main ones. We're, yeah. we're not product orientated, so we're not going to mention them. But the, yeah. other, the other one that I think is interesting was um, in a controlled environment. There was an Israeli trial, um, and this was... Was that a, with soldiers? Uh, that a, they, they worked at, at an atomic energy facility. Okay. And so they had their cafe and they had the different dots on there, what they were allowed to eat. And so yeah. there was the high carb diet, the, the let's say ketogenic diet, and then yeah. there was the Mediterranean style diet. And the ketogenic diet was better for quick weight loss and, yeah. and quick cardiovascular parameter drop or normalization. Yeah. But over, yeah. over two years, it basically evened out to the same as the Mediterranean diet. But the interesting thing there is that they had the dots. They had, that's my food. Mm. Great in a controlled yeah. environment. So I guess the question is, how do you overcome the slick marketing of really bad food? I just think that is in education. And that is, is that not what part of what our role really is, is to help educate that, that person in front of us to yeah. make the right choices and to recognize what is driving their choices um you know it comes leads us a little bit back to you know my background is in market research of food and drink and one of the i know the um the billions of dollars that is spent by um food the food industry to make food desirable so i'm educating clients on this we're trying you know trying to say and and the other key thing that i would also point out is when you have taken somebody from a, a relatively processed diet to eating whole foods for a sustainable period mm. you've waken you've awoken their um uh, taste buds mm. they are suddenly feeling energized and they know what real food kind of tastes like and they go back to essentially the cardboard food and they realize oh my god this actually tastes rubbish <laughs> so again it's the education it's always education what about portion size though i mean you can eat healthy food but you're going to eat too much of it yeah oh absolutely um but i would also say when you are actually ha having three meals a day you it's actually relatively hard to eat a massive portion of really fresh whole foods to beyond your not natural satiety level. But this is, again, what we do use. Portion control is part of the education gotcha. with the program. Can you have but, excess Brussels sprouts? What I would <laughs> say that one? 
Can you have excess Brussels sprouts though, please? I love <laughs> you can, Brussels sprouts. You can have all Brussels sprouts as your vegetarian, your vegetable portion, definitely. <laughs> but, you know, if you are actually saying, look, no snacking, that is actually where you really do can do the portion control. The snacking, that on, constant picking through the day. And I think if somebody, you know, many people really saw what they snacked on a day on one plate, they would probably be, or probably wouldn't fit on one plate. You know, it would be a, a bench top of food. And they'd be like, my God, if I really eat all of that? you know that's the so again getting the three meals a day and getting people to really recognize that that period that interval between the meals is almost sacred that's when your digestion is tidying up that's when your body is really processing absorbing and uh, leveling out and um, getting everything really ready for the next meal that is the the balance that we really want to get and the education there there is so much to cover here i would <laughs> We we could go into neurobehavioural disorders. We could go into, well, here's one, immunity. Um, yes. So, you know, we know, for instance, that diet has a, a, a reasonable impact at least on um, how our immune system works. We're now in this horrible age of COVID-19 mm -hmm. and we know that there are those people with comorbidities, cardiovascular and diabetes, the major two. Um, oh. Tell us a little bit about how this works with the risk of having, I think you might have actually mentioned it before. Um, I can't remember yeah. what you said though, but it's it's rather the perfect. I mean, this is a perfect storm. You know? yeah. It's just kind of like, what, what I actually, so, you know, I am not a, a virus expert in any way. I'm not, and I'll definitely say I'm not, what I, but I, what I do say is that we know the research is so, um, it's, it's very sound to say that people with metabolic disorders have got increased risk. Yes. Um, and it's, you know, hypertension, um, obesity, insulin resistance, glucose resistance, this all affects um, the, uh, the whole um, endothelial, endothelial dysfunction. Um, it, metabolic dysregulation seriously impairs that immune response and creates the cytokine storm, which then can, you know, lead down that path to, you know, very much adverse outcomes with COVID. Um, but we're and, not talking about a treatment. We're talking about no, prevention. Changing the risk. You you can actually change the risk factor yeah. as to whether somebody goes down that cytokine storm. And it, it that's really where we come from with let's just really get the diet right. Let's get all of that lifestyle factors into play that allows the balance to be restored. I mean, one of my theories, and I would love the research to be done on this, um, and I think it will be, but you know, this virus that particularly seems to be impacting on metabolic dysregulation and metabolic conditions, is it almost that perfect virus for our, um, for our society today? If this particular virus had been, you know, created or generated, whatever, um, in 1918, would it have had the same, you know, pandemic of With response? We didn't have the diabetes rates. We didn't have the metabolic syndrome rates in 1918. Um, and, you know, the the demographics of that virus, I believe, if I'm correct, was all about, the, you know, more young people, you know, young men um, in their 20s were affected. Yeah, different. And it's kind of like if we, yeah, if we had, you know, if, if COVID-19 was you know, if we didn't have the metabolic issues that we had, would it even be a pandemic? Mm. Or would it be a fairly benign virus that is, you know, just um, not, not so deadly? Mm. That's an interesting it's one. A, it's, I, I have <laughs> you no answer. You younger people getting um, Yeah. COVID but you also pain. have younger people with very poor metabolic um, health as well. well. Yeah. Unfortunately, today age isn't doesn't necessarily determine your your um your health at good all point. good point so 
again, the research will be done, you know, yeah, and I yeah. will. We really won't know this for years to come. Years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, more and more research will, will be happening on this for years to come. But it's just a question I have. That's all, you know. Yeah. It, so is there data collection so that more clarity can be gained for future dietary tweaks, for instance? Um, so I would say metabolic balance is constantly tweaking the database with the new research that comes out. Um, this is, you know, it is, um, it's a passion of the, for the team in, in Germany. And it's also, you know, it's very much uh, the database of the food is tailored to the individual countries because oh, wow. once you have the theory, you know, you can actually just apply it to the different nutrients and, and, and foods available in the different countries. Right. So again, it's always evolving and, um, and because research is evolving and that's the exciting thing about the world of research, isn't it? Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. amazing. Like when you think about cultural issues with eat, yeah. even eating, let alone the food. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, you have to take into account what fish can we, buy here in australia it's totally different to the fish you can buy in england and you have to take that into account so yeah we have to know and that's why it's um wow. you know again coming into real personalized nutrition it's a game changer with um giving people a real change there is so much more to learn there is so much. <laughs> you said get rid of a headache i've got one now <laughs> <laughs> There is so well, you know, that's there. really where, you know, let's get you on your, let's get you on an MV plan and we'll resolve all those headaches. <laughs> Cherry Wills, thank you so much for sharing just, I mean, this really is a tiny, tiny bit of what what's going on with metabolic balance, but I really thank you for sharing with no, us. I mean, this is just so interesting. Thanks so much for sharing this with us, sharing this with us today on FX Medicine. It's really brilliant work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks ever so much for your time. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. He's going to eat differently now. <laughs>